Well, we move past the Fed meeting and it's a gentle sea of green as risk assets rejoice. Are we now past the term premium tantrum that's seen yields rise up and then our bonds are structural buy? We're seeing a big couple of big names calling that situation. Are equity markets poised to make a structural move up into year end as seasonal factors kick in? And this lower volatility that we're seeing across asset class, does that mean that the carry trade in the FX market's back in business as well? We look at all the trades and ideas. This is the trade-off. Hi there, my name is Chris Weston, Head of Research here at Pepperstone. I'm going to be joined in two seconds by Black Morrow from Forex Analytics. And we're going to be talking about the big factors that are going through the markets, the setups, uh, and all the plays that we like and have on the radar, and some of the questions that you've been looking at for the week that has just been. So, Mr. Blake Morrow, please come into the program. Um, I want to talk about, uh, yeah, just a, a touch on a little bit about sentiment now, because I feel something in my bones that, it, that we've had a defining session, which we'll focus on in the session. Um, it feels like something's changed as we go into the year. And I don't want to talk about Santa Claus rally and all that nonsense, but um, it feels to me that, that, that something's changing. Are you buying it right now? It does feel that way, Chris. And um, I mean, you look at the price action today and it's hard to ignore the fact that the equity markets rallied sharply, we've seen yields fall. Um, you know, whether you're talking about the FOMC, the quarterly treasury treasury uh, issuance uh, that, that 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 was reported, what, there whatever the reasons were, sentiment has shifted. But you know, you still got to consider there's a pretty big you know, geopolitical backdrop well, let's, behind Let's us, discuss so. that. But I mean, I just want to sort some of the calls that you've been having your your trading community um, overnight from the US base. I mean, how 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 is the tone? Are, are people feeling feeling a little bit more optimistic, or are they are they? How is the sort of conversations that you're having with with with, with your community? Well, you know, that's interesting. Um, we've gone from a lot of like bearish setups for the last several months, really, or several you know several several weeks to kind of looking at counter trend moves and uh, develop over this last week. And, and, and the price action today kind of confirmed that, you know, some of the things that we've been seeing, um, whether they're going to have legs or not, I, you know, I, I think it's going to be really interesting in the, in the next couple of sessions, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. Well, let's go well, into it. Let's go, let's go into topical funder and let's get, let's get let's straight into it. the, let's get into topical funder there. All right, well, so, yeah, we talked about the defining session. So I want to explore this in a little bit more depth with you because we've seen the Fed meeting and we can talk about that in the next section in, in a bit more um, sort of micro sort of standard there. But yeah, we, we've seen, you know, some poor data. The ISM manufacturing number was pretty, pretty rubbish. Um, you know, we've, we've been seeing uh, the quarterly refinancing announcement, as you talked about there. I think, yeah, people went into that, yeah, expecting to see... Uh, clarity on on the level of issuance over the next three months f across the different maturities, and I think, yeah, you know, certainly if you're looking at the longer end in in uh, 10, 20, and thirty year uh, maturities, it was lower than what was expected by the market, and therefore people are saying there's a bit of supply out there. Uh, but we've seen a, a, an incredible move in the bond market. I mean, if you have a look at t uh, ten year real rates, um, they're down twenty basis points. I mean, that's massive. And then you've seen. Um, you know, 10-year treasuries down 16, 17 basis points, twos down 14 or so. Um, and then you've seen the likes of Jeffrey Gunlick coming out and saying that he's buying bonds and he thinks it's, this is time to buy. We saw Stan Druck and Miller uh, in the session before saying, you know, he thinks there's downside risks. We go into, into rates markets and we can see for June next year into swaps, we've basically priced in a full rate cut now. You know, we've got 93 basis points of cuts for next year, even though the Fed have been stamping it. We're not even looking at cuts now. The market's seeing something. Maybe it's a hedge. Maybe they're seeing a view there. But that's where we are. And of course, equities have rallied pretty hard. And, and, and whether this is sustained is the question I want to ask you. So, yeah, is there more in, 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 in the Treasury? Is this, is this the time to buy? Is this the time to buy risk into year end now? Is this the start of something new? Well, you know, Santa Claus is just I'm joking, Chris. I'm totally <laughs> joking there. <laughs> no, but uh, he's he is just going to be coming around the corner here shortly, as fast as this year has been going. But um, no, needless to say, I think you make a lot of great points, and it's not just uh, you know just 
U.S. Treasuries. You look at Boons, they look like they're about ready to rally back as well. You know, the gilt market. You're see- and, and, you know, you think about like the we just got past the Bank of Japan, which uh, you, you, what a you could argue. What that- a shimozo. I know. I mean, seriously, like they, they're just, you know. Happy go lucky, not you know, not a care in the world type of thing. My kid off you, as you, I go along. <laughs> you've got the Fed that 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 actually sounds, you know, you you saw the dovish undertones and the market picked up on that today uh, at the end of the day. And you can see all the banks are like, man, you know, that that the, the Fed's done. We're finished. Yeah, you know, they're, done. they're they're done raising rates. So, you know, it seems like there's a green light, but like I said, there's this backdrop that you always got to be thinking about. And and uh one of the other topics that uh, that we have to keep in mind is risk tends to trade a little heavier as we get towards the weekend. We also have the jobs report um, because people don't want to hold risk over the weekend. They go back right back and buy it on Monday if nothing bad happens. I think you're or, right. I think, you know, it's, a, I think so. it's a great point. But you know, I think if I if I feel the market's view on 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 the geopolitical sanctions, I, I feel that that they're becoming less sensitive to it. I think you know they they, they want to move on. I mean, obviously. You can't move on from from this, so it's obviously very, you know, concerning to see everything that's going on. But the market wants to look elsewhere and take its cues from other directions, Fed policy, all this kind of stuff. It feels like the market's trying very hard to become less sensitive to the news flow in the Middle East. And um, you know, as bad as that sounds, I think that that's that's what we're seeing. And 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 I think the market's feeling that it's going to be quite contained on a regional basis. And therefore, I think that there's a, I'm going to, you yeah, know. Yeah, I could be completely wrong, and I am often very wrong, but um, it feels like the market probably won't de-risk as much as it has done over the last three weeks going into the weekend at the moment. Yeah, well, you know, that's that's a that's a great point. I mean, there there still is an ongoing conflict. Some um, what's the name of that place that uh, you, you, Ukraine is still going on, right? I, obviously, I'm make, I'm making a little light of it, but you know, the markets do end up losing focus. And focusing on what's ahead, and right now it's monetary policy. It's, the market focuses on things that are going to affect earnings and monetary policy, and, and exactly, yeah. exactly, and that's that's where we're at right now. And unless unless something unless some some bigger players uh, come into uh, to the the fold as far as the Middle East goes, I think you're right. And as as you know, un how should I say it? How, what should I say is is um, as markets feel so out of touch right now. That's just kind of the way that markets do operate. I mean, it, it is. It is what it is, right, Chris? I hate that saying. But anyway, um, but let's talk about let's talk, let's shift gears and let's move over to the FOMC today and and talk about post FOMC price action. And I wanted to drill out some numbers for you. I went and looked at the rem, at the the whole year. I looked at uh, you know, February 3rd. Um, that's the day after the Fed met, uh, the first first meeting this year. Uh, the market was up like a half a percent. It gave it back the next day, um, or it gave it back on Friday. So on Thursday, it was it was up like a, a half a percent. Gave it all back on Friday, March twenty second, which was uh, the next Fed meeting or the day after the next Fed meeting. Market was up 0.42 percent. Uh, was down. Um, to almost like one point seven percent on Fed day, and it bounced back pretty aggressively. Uh, May fourth. Uh, down half a percent, 0.4 percent. Next day, it was nearly up two percent, so we got it all back. Um, June fifteenth, we were up almost a percent, but gave it all back the following week. But then the next two Fed meetings were the meetings that we kept rates unchanged. You know, we were down on July twenty seventh. We were down a half a percent, 0.54 percent. And September twenty first, our most recent Fed meeting, not not today or yesterday for you guys. Um, we lost 1.7% the following day. So, you know, I look at today's price action and I think, wow, it seems like a green light right now going into Asia uh, and going into Asian trade, uh, obviously where we're, where, where we're broadcasting right now. But I do, do want to also note that the last two Fed meetings were the two Fed meetings where we kept rates on hold. And so I don't know if there's a direct correlation there, Chris, but I am a little hesitant to chase it knowing where the S and P is at, knowing that we're right at the 200 D- DMA, um, could we get some legs higher? It feels like it, but do you want to take on that risk? And and so I'm going to turn it to you. What do, what do you think about the price action here? Well, I, I question whether this has now to- become a, a a buy on dips rally now. You know, and and obviously that that 
that sort of strategy works when you've got a strong trend and you're buying into it like a swing sort of strategy sort of thing. Um, and we don't have a trend at the moment, so it's still yeah, it's aggressive buying into this market now. But you know, if you're doing so, I, I would be doing it so in smaller size. So if you lose, you lose small. Um, but yeah, like we want to see follow through, and I think that, that that's where this this session in the session ahead is, is going to be so defining because yeah, if we do get that follow through buying, I think it could develop into a trend, and and then people start to chase it. I think positioning in a lot of risk assets has become very light, um, and and a lot of positioning can come into the market. You get FOMO capital coming coming in as well. We've got payrolls on Friday, so is that going to be the thing that derails it? And I think payrolls are really important. I think the labour market is really important. So look, I think that, you know we want to see something below the consensus. The sweet spot for risk again would be something around 150, 170, 170,000, something around that region. I think equities would love that. You'd probably see a few more buyers of bond yields down a touch. You know, you can talk about the unemployment rate 3.8 percent. I think that that matters. Obviously, it comes off a different survey, but yeah, if we were to see the unemployment rate staying around 3.8 percent, fantastic. Average hourly earnings. Well, the misconception about average early hourly earnings is your people say, oh, wages are going up. Well, it's really about how much people are earning and the amount of hours people are working. So you really want to have a look at the amount of hours that are people people are working, and that tells you the average that, that comes in. So you know if if people are earning the same but work less, you know then then effectively the average hourly earning goes up. So um, that's a really interesting point. So I think the payrolls don't do matter, and I think this could set us off. So we're going into that, and of course you know autos and strikes around that could could weigh on the number of job creations. But yeah, I think the market if we if we just see something. Yeah, you know, later this week in in sort of one fifty to one seventy one eighty thousand in that region. I think that would be, you know, push us push us higher, and I think that would be a, a, the next queue up. I think, and, and then people start chasing it. So, yeah, I think the the Fed meeting, for all intents and purposes, the way I read it, you know, um, too long didn't read kind of situation is is the Fed a non committal. They're seeing two way risks. Um, the, they know that the markets are doing a lot of the tightening for them, but all intents and purposes, there's no urgency. The Fed on balance think they're done, but they didn't want to tell us that. <laughs> so that's it. That, yeah. I think that sums it up nicely, actually. Yeah. So and and just to sum, just to wrap up this section, so price action tomorrow is going to be really important, yeah. I think. And then right. don't forget we do have Apple earnings too. So yeah, exactly. And all of the market, if you look at the options market, they're implying about a three point seven um, percent move up or down. Um, and so, yeah, you could see a bit of movement in an Apple on the back of that. Um, probably not so the same tunes as we've seen with like Google or anything like that. But um, yeah, a bit of movement in Apple, and um, you know, you could see some moves in. And remember, like, yeah, we're coming off the back of the last quarter, where Apple nearly dropped five percent on the day of earnings. So, you know, it can it can move quite aggressively. And of course, given its weighting on the Nasdaq, one suspects, yeah, you, know, you could see some violence there. Um, anyway, look, I want to go into the FX play because one of the things I've been looking at, Blake, is is, is the move in volatility I- across asset class. You know, you've got the VIX trading around 16, 16 just above 16, well, 16.8, 8, 16.9%. FX volatility has been crushed, absolutely crushed. Maybe that's because of what we're seeing in dollar CNH. Um, the PBOC and um, the Bank of Japan want a, well, certainly the PBOC, I think, have been a big resonant behind why we've seen such low volatility in the FX markets. But G10, EM, FX volatility is at 52-week lows. Bond volatility started to, to come down, rates volatility as well. And that leads me to into, into back into our good friend Carry, you know, going for the higher yield of currencies. And if I look at the way that Carry funds have performed, and, and, and you know, I, I can show charts on that in, in the section below, in the, in the comments, I'll, I'll drop some, some performance of, 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 of strategies carries now starting to really outperform um so that's the way i want to look at that and of course that leads me into the you know, the mexican peso the brazilian real the you know, they cut rates by 50 basis points today but certainly in mexico you know we're not expecting rate cuts until next year um and you know we're getting that big carry you go into g10 and you've got aussie to an extent relative to swiss franc the yen they become your funding currencies again so how I, I like that carry strategy. I think that's for me. As long as vols are going down, as long as we do see a, gr- a steady grind in, in in risk assets, equities, and credit, for example, then I think carry is the play for me. And I want to be long those high, 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 high plays and, and looking to fund it with Swiss and and the yen. How are you looking at it? Well, first of all, I, I'm I'm full of uh, currency plays today. That's all pretty much all my setups is is going to be currency. So if you uh, just just give you guys a give you guys a, a good heads up. But you know you have the dollar Mexican peso. It slid right into the 200 day moving average, and I think you're you're today at the close at the New York close. And so to point out that that if volatility stays low, if volatility FX volatility stays low, carry is attractive. 
I'd say yes, it, it it is until it's not, right? Until volatility picks up. And then that means you always got to be watching your back just to keep that in mind. Uh also, I have to I have to say, you know, when you when you ask where are the plays, you pointed out a couple of weeks ago that the Aussie is outperforming. It looks great. I mean, the Aussie is holding up very well in the current environment. Not so, so much against the you know, dollar, we, but against the crosses, it's been the place to be, right? It's been yeah, you look at the you look at the Aussie Kiwi. It, it's it's back above that 109.30. I played it on the short side. Uh, you know, as I told you guys last week, I was going to. I did that. Um, you know, but downside was very limited. It popped right back up again. Aussie Yen looks really strong. Euro Aussie's rolling over. Pound Aussie still has that big head and shoulder pattern we talked about like a week or two ago. I mean, you know, the Aussie doesn't look bad. So if you ask me, well, like where the plays are at. The Aussie looks pretty good in 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 today's environment. We've got a rate decision um, next week as well, and 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 yeah, I guess there's about a sixty percent chance they raise. So I think they do raise. I think that inflation number was their their yeah you know, the last line of regret, and that they'll they'll raise. Um, and and I think that's not fully priced in. So again, you know, you get that extra kicker, and and that that works better against the crosses. Um, because you know Aussie against the US dollar is does does take its cues a lot from what's happening in Chinese equity markets, which you can't find many friends at the moment. Yeah, they can't, right? Well, hey, I'm gonna, um, you know, we're gonna talk a lot about FX in, in just in just a few uh, just a few sections. So make sure you all stick around for those. But I want to I want to take it to our last subject, Chris. I want to talk about crude oil. Crude oil has been perplexing to me, and and I actually talked with your colleague Michael Brown about this, and you know, I was in I've been in search for answers, and it's interesting. You heard from Jeffrey Gunlock today. Uh, you mentioned him a little bit earlier. Just earlier today, he said something like, crude oil has been weak because it sees weak economic activity. I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know, economic activity, I guess, here in the U.S., because he's really U.S.-centric. U.S. has been pretty good. I mean, you got that ISM manufacturing data. It was a little not so good, but you, you got to look pretty good. Then the flip side is, he said, but it's dangerous to be short oil because of you know, the risks involved with the Middle East. And I'm like, yeah, okay, so I get that. So crude oil has been meandering around $81. It's been slumping, hasn't been giving anything to the bulls, but at the same time, you know, with the geopolitical risks, you would think that it would hold up a little bit better than it has. So in your view, Chris, what are you seeing pulling the the the, the crude oil market? Because for me, I'm a little perplexed, and usually I can be very directional on on instruments, crude oil being one of them. But right now, I just don't have my finger on the pulse. What What are your thoughts about crude oil here? Well, I mean, it's, it's a shame we can't bring up a daily chart of, um, uh, of, of yeah, Brent. Well, certainly more U.S. crude rather than Brent, because Brent hasn't quite got there. But if you have a look at U.S. crude, you can see we're just testing that, just breaking through that swing low that we got back in in mid-October. So, you know, that that technically, if, if it doesn't hold that level, then, you know, that's telling you something about the direction and, and, and you know, the lack of support that's coming in in this move down. But I think what's happened is, is you know, certainly with Brent and WTI, you, you built in uh, a, a premium into the market that we were going to get supply disruptions. And we really have to think about the Saudis in this situation because obviously they have a relationship with Israel. Um, and, and the idea that we were going to see supply disruptions of, of Saudi crude was, was probably the thing that had been priced into an extent. Now, I think everyone's sort of been speaking to their geopolitical um, analysts and, and you know, military strategists and all these factors and saying that the chance now um, of, of a Saudi disruption uh, is very, very low indeed. I think that, that that's what we've been hearing. That's the, the sort of what I've been reading. Um, is that the chance of a, of a disruption there is low. The chance of a, of a natural gas disruption uh, it seems to be quite low as well. Um, and we haven't seen that really spiking up through uh, 50, uh, European one through 50 uh, megahertz, megawatts per hour. Um, so I think the market's telling you that, that they priced in an element of supply disruptions. That's been paired right back. Maybe some of the data around the world, certainly in China, was a little bit weaker um, with the PMI numbers there. The... Um, you know, the, the the manufacturing numbers in the US were, were quite weak there as well. But the US economy has obviously been humming along quite well. What I say is in, in the fourth quarter, though, it is it, it has come back quite a lot. I mean, we sort of see the run rates at the moment are between sort of 1.2 to 1.7% down from 5%. So maybe that's a factor in there as well. So I think perhaps slower growth going into Q4. So it's still good growth, but slower growth. Um, and I think that Middle East um, premium has come out of the market in that situation. That's the way that I'm reading the market. But, but yeah, do you like, want to be? Do you want to be short though? That's the. I guess there's the well, question. It's is. difficult, you know. Uh, to, to be fair, I mean, if I want to hedge myself against, um, 
you know, a, a change in the in the news flow and and people genuinely believing that that we could see something that that, that involves a, some sort of conflict between Iraq, uh, sorry, Iran and and and, and the US. Um, and, and, and Iran and, and Israel, um, which would be a, you know, obviously a much worse case scenario. Then, then yeah, I think gold's going to tell you something about that, and that's going to go up to all-time highs, and you're going to see the Brent, Brent price reverse and flip very, very hard. But I think if we were to see that 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 news flow, which obviously we hoped it's not obviously not, not going to happen, and, and we think it's a low probability, yeah. Um, then yeah, I think you're going to see crude. Obviously, it's going to be a, a, a massive buy, but I don't think that's going to be a one-day affair. And you can flip that you can flip that view very, very quickly and react to it, right? And and I know I know we need to wrap things up, but see see this is where this is where it all gets a little convoluted because you start and I didn't bring this up in the slide or in our excuse me in our topic, but you look at gold. Gold isn't far off of two thousand. It's the losses have been very minimal. Dollar index is holding up pretty damn well near its you know two thousand twenty three highs. I know it's been it was down today, and people might say the tops in now because of what happened with the Fed today, but. You know, you know, you you take all that into account, and you're like, "Is crude going to go down?" I yeah. don't know. It's to well, the, the, the story is being written as we speak. Well, the interesting so. thing with gold, and um, before I get the old uh, wrap up from the producer, the one thing from gold is that you had, you were you were using it as a as a geopolitical hedge, and it was the the best place to be like for that geopolitical hedge. But what now we've seen is 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 you're right. Crude's come down. Gold's come down a little bit but what's happening for this process is the US dollar has not found any real love despite equity markets recently drawing down the, 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 the US dollar hasn't been a safe haven particularly well in that situation it hasn't reacted to the better data on a relative basis so you've not really had that dollar flow but what you're now getting is real rates are coming down people are talking about being structurally long bonds which of course is good for gold um, and you're seeing more aggressive rate cuts being repriced back into the rates market, which is something that the gold price has been doing. So maybe what we're looking now as gold investors and traders is less about the geopolitical issues and back onto interest rates as a potential driver when you're taking the variance. So the, the tides change all the time and, and markets become sensitive to various factors. And that's the thing I'm looking at now is, is will... Uh, the gold market take less of a cue from geopolitics and more back from the bond market because that relationship had broken down. Is it back on again? Is it back on? That's what no we're going to look at. No anyway, I got, I got you, producer. Yeah, I got you. <laughs> anyway, we're back on. Let's oh, wait, go to wait, the, wait. Let's, let's go to some <laughs> of the setups. I'm going to get shot. <laughs> All right, uh, we talked about our good friend Carrie. Um, but we've got an RBA meeting uh, next week, and I think that I, I do think that they raise. Um, I know a lot of some people don't think they will. That's fine. Um, uh, I'm not an economist. I just look at market pricing. I think that the risks are skewed there. Um, and I look at the setup. You know, we've we've been trading in this kind of last couple of months. We've been trading in a, a bit of a channel, a bit of a range. That range trading strategy has been working well. We've got that price now broken out of the top Bollinger Band, which tells me the market has spoken out and saying that, um, that, that they like this. So carry coming into this, I, I think the Bank of Japan meeting surprised a lot of people. I mean, yeah, we, the day before we get um, a press release um, in the Nikkei saying that they're going to tweak policy, everyone says, oh, you're going to move to see the YCC band taken to 1.5% from 1%. They just say, well, we're going to have a flexible, bench, um, uh, a flexible mindset. Um, so again, they just frustrated the market once again. Um, and it feels like the Bank of Japan are just making this up on the spot. Um, so look, yeah, but ultimately, technically, which is what we're doing here, um, it, it's broken out. It just looks like it wants to go through that previous high. Uh, I think this kicks. I think it's got legs. Um, Blake, what do you think? Well, uh, first of all, like I like I said, I think the Aussie looks good on all the crosses. And yes, the Bank of Japan, that was like a, wow, oh, gosh, that was horrible. I mean, we, you know, the, the market was like, oh, here we go. You know, look, they, they dropped the little hint with the Nikkei. And as you pointed out, it was a big nothing burger, and uh, the tweaks were very minimal. And anyway, so the yen's weakening. You got the Aussie strengthening. Where if you connect those highs, like the high from the middle of your chart all the way through the tops, that's a triangle top. And we're coming right into it right here, right now, at this moment as we're we're speaking, and it's within about ten pips. So I'm gonna just say I'm gonna just gonna say this 97 yen level, really big, roughly 96.70 to 97 yen level, really big on a closing basis above that opens up a new trend high. Now, again, I'm going to say that I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to say that you have to look at risk and be very careful because the Aussie yen 
and the, the, the stock markets have a very strong correlation. As I pointed out a little bit earlier, if the S&P is down a half percent tomorrow, ASEAN is probably going to be a casualty of that. So just you know, knowing, knowing that there are risks as we're up here, but Boy, I tell you, like I said, Chris, I just want to touch on looking, the end. Yeah, I mean, if it, the other thing is, is 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 the intervention. If if, if the Bank of Japan, or Ministry of Finance were to intervene, I, I don't think we're there at the moment. I think I think we've got to be looking at, you know, whilst we're seeing the you know, Kunda and, and and the the FX chiefs talking about like, looking at rates and various. I think it's yeah, you know, it's obviously the rate of change that, that that the Bank of Japan and, and the Ministry of Finance look at more more appropriately. But I think the level, if you want an absolute level, I think we've got to be above 155 in dollar yen, um, and we're not there at the moment. So um, I think I think yeah. the intervention risk is still, it's there, and that's a worry if you if you want to be short yen. But um, yeah, I, I think it's I think that that strike price is higher than where it is at the moment. All right. Well, thank thank you, Chris, for bringing the Aussie yen up as a setup. I like it. Um, so I'm going to bring up my first setup is the. U.S. dollar, Norwegian krona. We have the the crown or the kroner, and it is up, knocking, knocking. Get it, knocking on heaven's door. And uh, we have, we have the uh, the Norges Central Bank meeting uh, that's coming up. Actually, uh, some of you will see this after the meeting. They are expected to keep rates unchanged. But I want to show you, and you see a bunch of numbers written there. Um, so if you go back, you you see where it says eleven thirty. It was eleven point three zero. That was the high from basically the end of end of May this year. Uh, that connects, if you connect the COVID lockdown highs to that 1130, comes in right to where we're at right now. And this is a weekly chart. I'm showing you guys a weekly chart. 1127 was last week's high. This week's low was 1110. So you see the 1130 and 1110, those are your breakout points. Now, I'm going to say this. I don't know why the U.S. dollar Norwegian krona is as strong as it is, but it is. That's the, th the price doesn't lie. And in this case, if we break above 1130, it is a bullish breakout. It's probably going to be because of some you know, geopolitical risk. The flip side is if you want to short it, you know where your risk is at. And if it breaks below 1110, then that means it's cracking near-term support and we can look for lower prices because you, you might notice I have a little ascending wedge in there because this is a weekly chart. So those little ascending wedge on a daily charts, it's a great setup. Either way you want to play it. Chris, what do you think? If you if you didn't tell me what that was right now, if you didn't tell me what the what the market was of the instrument, which of course a lot of to, to pure technical and price action traders, you don't really care what it is. It's just the market is the market, and you're right. The, right. the price is the final arbiter of truth. It always yeah it is what you trade, and if you lose money, you know you just got to react to that. Um, but yeah, if you if you talk, didn't tell me what that was, I would tell you right now that I think there's downside risks. That you've got that support uh, resistance level, you've got the the wedge. Uh, I would say obviously wait for the the completion of the break of the wedge. But I think there's that confluence of, of resistance levels um, tells you that, that yeah for me that the that, that the market will probably sell dollars on this one and, and knocky. But yeah, if I'm looking at risk currencies, yeah the knocky works incredibly well when you get a, an all out risk vibe coming through markets it's the highest beta currency of the lot you can actually see the knocky rally quite strongly even though its terms of trade brent is is falling and that's because it you know it comes in as just an out and out risk currency but i think in this market you know i probably prefer the aussie um i probably prefer the swedish krona to the knocky um, but from that chart which of course is the, what we're looking at here just a pure setup basis i, I feel there's downside risks i think it breaks through that to the downside of that channel there and and there you go. I mean, if you're if you're a dollar bear and you are bullish on risk, this is a great short because you know where you're wrong. You know, you get it gets above eleven thirty one. You know, it slides out. Things well, I don't think we can scream. Be, I don't think we can be. A, to be honest, I don't. I don't. I don't I'm not a dollar bear. Um, I, I still see a lot of attractions in the US dollar, um, especially yeah, against the euro, for example. I think you know I like selling euros at higher levels um, than where we are, and cable as well. But I think if you if you're looking at risk, then it's the high beta plays that that, that, that probably look a bit better. Um, and yeah, probably the Antipodeans as well. Let's go to NASDAQ. I'm going to have a look at the NASDAQ. And what I'm going to actually do here uh, is have a look at the seasonality. I know there's a lot of people out there who believe in seasonality and say, well, this is, um, uh, you know, something that, that can come and, and give us some sort of predictable patterns. And if, yeah, I think in, into year end, I definitely think there is um, you know, an air of seasonality that, that that gives us an expectation because you know, for active managers who are now looking at the Nasdaq and or yeah, you know, the S and P and seeing gains and you know, if the market moves up into year end and you're underperforming by a 
couple of percent or so, you know, you've got to be paid and, you, and so you chase. But what I'm looking at here, uh, Blake, is the, the is the NASDAQ futures um, and, and the, 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 um, the, the performance or the form guide that we see in November. Now, this time can be different and the set of circumstances is obviously different. Um, but look at the performance that we see in the NASDAQ up 11 years in a row in the month of November. Um, and it feels like, goes back to the point that we're saying, that, that it feels like something has changed and that, that, that risk can be applied. If you're looking at that form guide, you know, you're back in the casino, you're looking up and you're seeing, you know, 12 reds or 11 reds in a row. Do you go black on the back of this? So, you know, do you, do you, do you carry the momentum? For some odd known reason, the NASDAQ loves November. Do we buy on this? That, you know, I, I mean, look at you. This is you admitting that you actually believe in Santa Claus rallies without even saying it. I'm not, you know, I'm this not, is I'm great. Not I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I am not i do not believe in... It's a I, revelation. I, I don't want to call it Santa Claus. I just want to call it the idea of, of chase, you know, and, and you people flip over into the new year and you got to get paid. And, 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 and you, you know... know you, I, yeah. If it's going no, up, sorry, you've got to be in the market. You. You've, got to be, you've got to be in the market. But there you go. So I'm I questioning to you, like with volatility, I mean... A lot of green there, Blake. Are you feeling? You feeling that it's going to be? Do you think it's going to be a green November twenty twenty three? Well, it, lo- it looks like it. And you know what? It's interesting because this is the Nasdaq, right, Chris? It is the Nasdaq. Yep. Yeah. Nasdaq. It is the Nasdaq. You you know you know what is a, a a safety play to a lot of investors right now? Tech. A lot of people feel that tech is the place they want to be. You know. So I mean. It's it's hard to fight that type of trend that you see every single year. I, th- I think we see a couple of bad years, but that was that was what 2008, 10, and 11. I mean, that was right after the GFC. So you look post GFC, you know, in 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 a in a in an environment where the Fed is ballooning its balance sheet. Yeah, we are in rally mode, no doubt. But at the same time, I have to say that this year may be different because the Fed's not doing what they have done. For the last ten years, either. well, I think if you so. if you're bullish bonds and, and you think real rates are coming down, that pressure valve on tech um, would would come off. Um, a lot really depends on what happens to the US dollar. But if we were to see bond yields coming down as some of that data calls, then I, then I think the mega cap techs are your defensive play. They're your recession hedges, and 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 I think yeah that, that we could see another um, another green on screen. So this time next uh, next month, Blake, we'll be revi- remind me of this chart. And we'll uh, we'll revisit it. I can't wait to remind you when I'm wearing my Santa cap. I cannot wait. All right, Chris, let's <laughs> let's move it. I'm gonna I'm gonna wear a Santa cap this season. I'm telling well, yeah, you, it's coming. I think just just on that point is, is Crocs report tonight, and you love a bit of Crocs as well, don't you? <laughs> Boo on you. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and move to the last setup, which is going to be sterling, or as uh, as a lot of people like to call it, the pound or the sterling or the 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 uh yeah whatever anyway we have the bank of <laughs> england tomorrow chris um you know it's it's interesting so many people are so bearish pound dollar and they they and and rightfully so look at that descending trend line that's just capped the market that comes in right around the 12210 level 12240 is a 618 retracement that is the number i'm going to tell you guys to watch on the top side if we break above 12240 tomorrow it should be game on and if the dollar is weakening as a result add that in as a bonus you know with risk on we get past the the bank of england we're above 12240 this thing's going to get a counter trend rally now the flip side is we start breaking back below let's just call it about 12050 12070 somewhere around there we might get a new trend low and just remember the trend has been down and so when you get a consolidation and a downtrend like this tends to be a resumption of trend so that means the odds still favor downside but the bank of england is the big wild card for tomorrow uh so chris what do you think about the pound the sterling (laughs) um or pound um yeah i I think the bank of england uh bank of england meeting i mean it's going to they're obviously not going to raise and there's going to be probably be a six three split in the voting there and if you have to look at rates markets and swaps markets they're not yeah they're not pricing really anything now they're they're done the market's saying that the bank of england are done and you know we go into mid next year we're going to probably start seeing a bit of easing playing through um 
I can't remember, we've got about 30 basis points of cuts being priced between now and this time next year in the UK. Uh, obviously, that aggressive rate hiking has come out of the market and that we've obviously seen the pound follow suit. But yeah, I agree. I think you made a really, really good point in the in the sense that everyone's bearish pound. Positioning has got very, very rich in terms of shorts and yeah, maybe that can, that can cause a squeeze, but you know, I, I don't really want to fight the dollar. So I like this setup. It tells me a lot about what people are thinking there, that we've had this big move. People are unsure. Yeah, when you get that, uns- un- after that big move and, and people are saying we're not sure you get that battle and you get that that price compression you're seeing that with the you know sort of triangle there and 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 yeah i think the market now needs to reveal itself so after a big move after a big amount of rates coming out after services have, have come under the labor markets come under a lot of scrutiny in the uk at the moment um, we are at a very clear inflection point and price is telling exactly that same message. So the question is, is what happens next? The market doesn't know what happens next, otherwise it would be moving uh, and we're waiting for that to happen. So yeah, wait for price to react and tell you what's going to happen. Uh, and that should, in theory, set off uh, some sort of new trading bias in the market. But for now, we watch and wait and uh, we wait for those signals to kick in. Now, I am I think I'm right to go through to play of the day. <laughs> I think I've got it right this time. <laughs> yeah, let's go to play of the day. All right. Well, I, I last week was a, was a shocker. I went into 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 Kiwi uh, yen, um, switching from Kiwi Swiss, and that was working really well. Um, and then we've just seen this big rap, 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 uh, reversal. So it's quite important to to cut those losses very very soon. And I did so. Um, what I'm actually doing this week is taking a slight, well, taking a, a very different view, and 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 going on this vibe that I've been working on, with, which is that, that carries back. I'll, I'll post the chart in the comments after the show that talks about the different strategies, value, carry, a few of the other sort of tactical strategies, but carry's now coming back into vogue. And I talked about that the EM FX implied volatility is 52 week lows. You know, we've got forward points between MEX and yen, you know, pushing back up. That gives you that level of carry to get paid into positions. So I like this one on pullbacks, you know, 845, eight, just a little bit above that level. I think any kind of bit of heat coming out, bang, it goes up. We've got the Mexican Central Bank next week. We're not expecting any rate changes from that. Um, maybe they sort of give an indication that, that that's still coming. That's the vibe the market gets. But I think from a pure strategy perspective, this is going up. I love the trend. The rate of change is working quite nicely. I want to get swings into that move. Um, and I think carries the place to be at the moment. So as long as volatility in broad asset markets stays low and is actually continues to fall, as long as the, the, the this Nasdaq trade kicks up that we've been talking about all show, then Mex, Mex yen <clears throat> is going higher, in my opinion, and buying pullbacks makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of assumptions being made. The stars need to line, but the market's already telling you they like the trade. And if that Nasdaq kicks, falls stay low, you know, for me, Mexican peso is going to work very, very well. All right. Well, thanks, Chris, for the Mex yen. Remember, the dollar Mex is at uh, the 200-day moving average, and I, I should mention that because my play of the day last week was we were looking at the Day of the Dead, which happens to be today is one of the Days of the Dead here in North America that uh, Mexico is celebrating, and so it's a bank holiday. Is it a bank holiday? It is oh, a sure. holiday. Okay, give, 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 give love to my uh, my boy Quasar, who's uh, okay. he might be celebrating <laughs> it today. There he is. Um, but also, uh, it, didn't, it never broke eighteen fifty. But it is back at the two hundred DMA, which is pretty good support. All right, my play of the day is going to be the Euro Swiss. Now, the Euro Swiss, as you can see, is in a descending channel. We do have Swiss CPI. It's going to be a few hours from from right now the, at the time of recording. And um, as long as this currency pair stays below 96.50, that's going to be the 78% retracement of the most recent drop. Uh, I still want to be on the short side of this because the Euro Swiss acts as a de facto safe haven type of trade against anything. It's kind of like a hedge, if you will. Um, So if, if something should, geopolitical reasons why, should go wrong, the Swiss franc would probably take the uh, take the helm as a as a as a safe haven currency. So again, as long as we're below 96 uh 9650, I like this one to the short side. Remember we do have CPI out of Switzerland tomorrow. So I prefer not to not to be a seller of the euro swiss higher. I prefer to actually sell it uh, or be short on a move lower if swiss CPI comes in hotter than expected. But that's my play of the day, and that's how I'm going to be playing it. I'm not in it, but I'm looking to be in it, Chris. So you'll be in it to win it. Yeah, some of the other ones I'm looking at. If you if you 
prepared to pay a little bit more spread for the movement and the trend is, is some of the LATAM currencies. We talked about MEX, but yeah, the, the Chilean pesos on an absolute tear given some of the measures that they've been putting in and also the Colombian pesos working quite well. So yeah, get a bit of spice in your life, get some LATAM uh, effects in there. So that's an interesting one. The other one as well, I don't want to talk about it today, um, Solano. In the, in the in the crypto up about 100 percent 110 percent in the last couple of weeks so one for the radar there I'm sure there's a few people who are a bit more versed in in, in some of the altcoins and, and you know more sort of high beta cryptos um, but yeah that's that's one to put on the radar that's absolutely ripping at the moment so we're seeing a bit uh, you know some good interest there from clients to, to look at that one anyway thank you very much for everyone for watching this far uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, give us uh, any comments that you have about you know, Solana or, or how you're seeing the markets, whether you're seeing this turn that I'm potentially seeing, Blake's potentially seeing, um, and how you're playing these markets. Any questions you want us to address next week? See you next week for the trade-off.